Hello everyone, one more time. It's Kateřina Pekova. I'm the community manager at STRV and I'm really happy that I can welcome you here all at our online Android talk. It's our 12th online event in this quite strange time and this online version of uh, our meetups. Uh, I'm really happy to see such a great show up and I see that, that there are still people joining us. So, um, that's it. Uh, I will just uh, want to tell you a few basic rules uh, so your experience is as lifelike as possible. You have many options how you can interact with uh, the speaker, with us or with another participants. Uh, our priority is the possibility to raise your hand. Uh, so if you will have any questions during the talk or after the talk, don't hesitate to use that. You can just raise your hand and the moderator or I will step up and we'll, we will unmute you and you can ask the speaker directly. Also, there is another chance how you can ask your questions in Q&A section. We will get to it uh, after the talk. And then, uh, there you, then you can also use the chat of, and you can connect with the panelists or also the attendees. Uh, when you will be in the chat section, you can see that you have uh, options if you wanted to write to all of the people or just to the panelists. So uh, just uh, so you know how everything works here and you can enjoy the talk without any major technical issues. Uh, so that's well, basically all from me. I will just want to introduce our speaker, Andre Komarek, our uh, Android engineer at STRV, and also uh, along with him, Václav Tarantík, who is Android lead at STRV, and who am I giving the word now. Thank you, guys, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's great to see you all here. We hope you will enjoy the event. As Katka said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask it. And if you have anything else we, we, we can help you with, email us or contact us. We will be happy to help you with anything, basically. If you have any tips for upcoming events, feel free to share them as well. And we'll be happy to prepare a meetup for as you wish. So and I'll, I'll, I'll pass the word to Andra and enjoy the event. OK, thanks. So uh, as I saw from the poll you just went through, uh, most of you already visited some kind of event we did some of you even visited a live event so i hope it will be as close as possible to the actual thing okay so let's start with presentation i hope everybody is able to see my screen now um yeah, so the presentation is it's called Locomotive AR and it's basically AR game slash demo which we created here at STRV. And I will, um, at first I will talk some basics about, uh, about AR core. Uh, then I'll mention something about Sceneform, which is also technology we used for building the game. And then we, take a look at the game and uh, at last uh, I will tell you some detail about the math which is behind that because that's fairly fascinating thing and the most interesting part or something I learned during the project. So we can start with the scene form and AR core part. Um, I know you already finished uh, some polls but Let's go with the, another one. Uh, I want you to, to answer the question um, if you ever used AR core before. So I know 
how much should I spend in this part of the talk, how much details do you need, and so, so on. If you are watching on YouTube, you are not able to vote, but well, maybe you will join uh, next event using, uh, using the Zoom platform. Okay, I, I can already see that there's one person that did some project, few of them played a bit with, with, the, with the AR core and majority didn't he heard about it at all or just maybe some basic info. So I hope that uh, this presentation will be just the right amount of info you need to, for example, get started with your own project or incorporate AR core into your existing product and significantly improve that uh, using that technology. So AR core is, is Google's platform for building AR apps. It was announced a few years ago so right now it's not like really experimental, it's fairly established. And it provides few ways how to help you with building AR app. The most important part is that you are not handling any plane discovery, you are not handling any motion tracking or anything like that. It can provide uh, some info about light estimations and if you have specific devices, it can also uh, work with depth API, which is basically able to uh, provide real-time occlusion of objects. And it provides cloud anchoring, which I will show you later. Uh, there are certain devices which support certain experiences. It basically depends which, which kind of resolution uh, this kind of device is able to support. Uh, you can later discover it uh, under this link. So make sure if Katka asks you about some detail or contact about you to answer her because we will be sending uh, these slides plus some uh, extras later on. Um, so for example, pixel devices or most, most of the newer ones or for example, OnePluses, they are able to work with the with the depth API, but most of the devices aren't. So make sure that um, it's not crucial for your, for your specific use case or app. Uh, starting out with AR core is fairly simple. There are plenty of demos on the internet. Google made uh, quite a lot of them with different applications. So the best way to actually start is to try to uh, just download some and compile it and maybe take a look what is happening there. Uh, if there is uh, some part you can actually uh, use in your project and maybe you can even start just by modifying some simple project. So that's also definitely something which may be interesting to you. And also another important resource to check out before actually starting with AR core is design guidelines. So you actually know what your app needs to do. So Google will actually accept it in the Play Store. It's basically related to the stuff like sizing of your, of your experience. So it can be, for example, experienced in table size, but also expanded to the, to the size of the room and so on. Uh, this is this is example of how cloud anchoring actually works in AR core. Uh, it's basically a function which uh, is able to create some anchor of real world and share it across the devices. So if uh, another device confirms that it's, uh, it wants to connect to the same AR session, it can get info about uh, placement of the objects and so on and it can render the objects in the same way so the experience can be actually shared across the devices. I didn't include that in my game demo, but that's definitely something we want to uh, do, do uh, later. So, uh, so yeah, 
Um, but uh, here in bottom, there's nice source uh, where the image actually came from. And it's actually really nice article. So if you want to include cloud anchoring in your app, that's, that's maybe way to start. Okay, a little bit more info about, about AR Core. Uh, it can be set up in a way that's required or optional. It's uh, set, set up in manifest application metadata. And um, it, it basically makes sense to have um, AR Core as a required technology if you are building, for example, AR Core game. But uh, if you are doing something that you want just to uh, expand your app experience, for example, like Google Maps, which recently introduced uh, AR, AR navigation, you can choose to have this just optional. The way to start is basically just to give camera permission and uh, fit AR fragment into your layout. And that's basically it. There's not really that much more to do to really start with AR core. Let's go to the scene form, which is basically system, which is sitting kind of above AR core layer because it's providing you a way how to, how to easily, how to easily uh, have some coordinate system. And uh, it's basically like rendering layer, which is above AR core. So AR core is providing you a way how to work with environment, how to have some anchoring and stuff. And scene form is a way how to place object into the, into the scene. Uh, you have vector free, which is representing local or word, word position and quaternions, which are defining rotations of objects. Uh, scene form is nice because it supports a handling of tabs and gestures like pinch to zoom, uh, dragging and dropping and, and gestures like that, which are pretty, pretty um, necessary, I would say, for um, manipulating the scene and, for example, for scaling the scene to the, to the user environment. Uh, the way SceneForm works is that you have some kind of anchors, which are, which are defined by the AR core, and then you basically add some objects which are like fixed to the scene. You can, uh, for example, just add one object which is fixed to the plane you discovered. And then every node can be a child of the original node. So whole scene is basically um, static to the, to the uh, environment and it's not, it's not doing any weird stuff. And if you transform one of the objects, for example, if you rotate it, other will rotate too. Uh, one of the issue of scene form is that it uses proprietary object format. I don't even remember the name, but uh, it can be converted uh, from object files using some utility, but yeah, it's not really without any issues. And the weirdest part about it uh, is that it's not supported or developed anymore, which is kind of a bummer, but you can still use it. I wouldn't say it's really that project, but um, it's something it's something which uh, you need to keep uh, keep in your mind. It's it's really something which is maybe suitable for smaller things for smaller projects. Uh, not really for something super robust. Uh, this is screenshot from Google's uh, GitHub repo. It shows a mess which, which happened uh, at the end of the project that they kind of switched between the object formats and then, then back. It's kind of a mess. So basically either you will use the last version or the six, uh, 1.16. Uh, the whole point of SceneForm is basically that it's super easy to use for Android developers who are not really 
that proficient with, for example, let's say Unity or uh, other tools or directly OpenGL. Um, and it was developed in that way, but maybe Google thought that um, experiences which are done by independent Android developers are maybe not cool enough for them. Uh, so um, they basically cut the project after like two years. But you can prove them otherwise because I feel that Sceneform is still pretty capable and it's far from being actually dead. I can get back to the video which actually shows the gestures in some sample scene. I hope it will be visible on the stream because I think it went through like three or four compressions before it will actually arrive to your computer. So yeah. Oh. Will it play? It will play. So here we can see rotation of the scene, now scaling and now dragging. And if I choose to build the depot, which is fixed, now I cannot move it. I cannot stretch it. It's already done. Um, it defines the scene. It defines the coordinates. It defines basically everything. You can definitely undo that, but this is basically the way how do you, how you basically set up the scene to the user and start with building something. So more info about scene form. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, you can still use it for a hobby size project. It's, uh, not, it's not a problem that it's not being developed anymore. It's easy for you, hopefully. Most of you are Android devs, so, so yeah. Um, and already I mentioned that alternatives are more powerful, but even more scary. Uh, one of the weakest part about Sceneform is its documentation, which is, hmm, I mean, it's, it's maybe harsh to say non-existent, but uh, for someone which is, who is starting on the, on the Sceneform project, it's definitely something which is quite complicated. For example, if you are not really that familiar about quaternions, maybe you didn't have it on your university, or maybe it's just too complex because it is, uh, the documentation will not simply support you that much. Okay, so let's take a look what other tools you might need to actually build your first scene form slash AR core app. So we will probably need some uh, like Blender or SketchUp, or you will need to get your objects from some internet libraries. Um, with what is especially uh, important stuff or like useful thing is this link. It's euclidianspace.com. And this specific one is uh, talking about quaternions and it shows how they manipulate some sample object. And I don't know how like proficient are you with quaternions, but this is something which helped me a lot uh, to navigate uh, the issues I faced because working with these little creatures is simply really, really hard. Also, you can use this site for a lot of other stuff if you ever need to do anything math related in your programming. Also, you need to co convert your object files to the proprietary format, which is done by the tool, which is called Google AR Asset Converter. Um, at the bottom, you can see the command which is actually used to do this conversion but um, it, can, it can create some issues like um, bad working with textures or the objects can be a little bit broken. So you need to try maybe different settings or what helped a lot is actually to convert, uh, convert objects to use only triangles and nothing else. Also, you need to make sure that uh, the object is not like really huge because then it will try to shrink it down and it's also pretty nasty. 
and then you will need supported device or emulator. I didn't try emulator, but I feel it will be really something ugly to work with. So I totally recommend having some device. I think that most of recent devices should work just fine. Okay, so last point from this section, why actually build AR? And I found these three arguments why you should do your part and <laughs> try to do something in AR. Uh, Google and Apple is investing heavily into it. You can see that, for example, that uh, recent uh, iPhones and iPads, they have LiDAR sensor, which is actually like AR on steroids. So they uh, believe the concept that much that they actually are building hardware for it. That's, that's really nice. That's really powerful. Uh, Google, for example, builds an extension which is uh, providing AR navigation in maps. I'm not sure if you tried it, it's all right. But you can see that these huge companies are actually investing in it and uh, they are saying that uh, AR will be bigger than VR. So it's nice to have some experience in this field. It's logical because, well, VR headsets are not uh, really for everybody. They are kind of expensive, but uh, most of the mobile devices are capable of some at least basic AR. It can also do some uh, major enhancements for your product. Uh, or it can be nice differentiating factor for uh, for your app. And also, well, you will learn something new and have fun. Okay, let's take a look on some uh, screens, videos and stuff related to the Locomotive AR project. Do we have any questions from the audience or something like that? Or are we all good? No questions so far. Awesome. So let's continue. So this is a screenshot from uh, from the from the demo. Uh, this is quite unpolished UI because it's it's not it's not really done yet, but I think it can still show the how it's actually how it's actually done. So. Um, the gray piece is actually called depot for the scene and it's the first object you will place into the scene. And the red selected object is object which is just being built or something. Um, the green parts are open ends. So you can only place uh, track pieces to the, to the end of the track. And that's basically it. So I chose in this app, in this app a grid approach. So every piece adheres to a certain grid. Uh, it, it, it provides uh, some, some nice possibilities and it's uh, also a little bit easier to connect the track back and you are not accum accumulating mathematical errors. Uh, if you are building something bigger and uh, you are using just just um, like connecting pieces without any any grid logic. Okay, so let's show how it actually works from the beginning. You can discover plane by by just jiggling foam around. You can rotate it. You can you can place the depot node which sets the scene, then you can start building the, uh, building the blocks. Um, in this demo, I'm using just like simple, uh, simple grids because we don't still have uh, rails ready for the, for the demo, uh, which would uh, actually adhere to the grid. But uh, for the demo purposes, I think it's all right. And you can see how the building works, how object selection works and so on. Yeah, and train is going. 
So this is basically current state of the demo that you are able to build simple track. You have few pieces available and you are, you are able to ride a train. Okay, let's take a look uh, about, um, about how this is actually done. So for scene form, you can basically create two types of objects. Uh, one is uh, imported from modal. That's the line you can see at the top. It's you are basically just referencing the object uh, in your resources and you can just take it like that. It's fairly simple. Then you can assign it to some node and basically render it. Uh, second way how to actually do some object um, is to create um, some scene form renderable. You can, you can create dynamically just cylinder, sphere, or cube. Nothing else is available. So um, yeah, it's fairly limited, but you should do your magic with just this. Uh, this code actually at the bottom actually shows how the ping grid, which, uh, which actually shows the possible play area is created in the game. Now here's some code which is actually showing how you can create some kind of uh, some kind of object and associate it with AR scene and add it actually to the fragment. Um, the most important part is actually the line at the bottom. Uh, you can see there that you are basically just accessing AR fragment and scene you are adding a child which has some kind of anchor and that's basically it. Every single object you add to the scene next, if you want to have it static, is basically added as a child to depot node. So it moves with it and so on. Now I have um, some kind of little bit more compl complicated thing, but it's mostly just to imagine um, how hard it is actually to get from a grid representation to actually rendered on object. So let's imagine that uh, the gray piece with, with the red dot at the center is a depot and you have some piece you want to connect to the top and you want to place it in the scene and render it. So first, uh, you need to basically have some template representation of the object. You need to know that it has some start, some end, and it has, it has some pieces. You need to have, uh, for this case, you need to have like real pieces and fake pieces because you are placing object by its center. So uh, you even need to count with like the fourth piece to actually be able to place it correctly. Uh, then, uh, because uh, you start um, like shifted in zero zero coordination system in grid coordination system, you need to basically move it one tile up because that's the that's the piece that's the place you are connecting it to. If you would want to place next piece, you would need to place it to like minus something something. So we need to recalculate those like base grid coordinates to the, to the actual position you need to place it to. Then you need to actually rotate the grid coordinates because, well, if you want to place next piece, it will be rotated to the left, as you can see, if you would use that green slot at the top. So that's, that's the next step. Then you need to create transformable node with all the proper properties and, um, the hardest part is actually to do transformation from the grid system cord, uh, like grid coordination system to the actual real system, which is used by scene form because scene form has its own coordinates and you need to basically rec recalculate the center of the piece to the scene form coordinates, which is kind of daunting because you need to work with like um, rotation of the scene form scene related to the something some some base and it's really something um which is not super easy to do 
uh, then the last thing you need to do and it will be related to the topic uh, which I will talk about next is to recalculate rough track points which are actually describing the way train goes uh, to the same uh, to the same position the actual track piece is then you basically uh, in, uh, save the new state in your internal representation of it and after you can finally like render it and that's that's all uh, what this example shows is that if you are working with great logic like this in scene form it's really something that requires constant recalculations between the grid logic and and scene form, scene form coordinations, but I think it's worth it uh, because uh, letting users build in grid system is simply something they are kind of used to. Okay, we are getting close to the last section and it's related to the Katmulram spline, which is really some interesting piece I learned and use in this project. And I think we will start uh, the next poll right now. And I'll be asking you if you ever heard about Catmulram spline and if you ever used it. <laughs> I see two nose, three nose, four nose. Oh my. Hmm. So far I see 10 times no and four times no, but I know other ways how to represent a curve. Okay, so <laughs> it seems that everybody here will learn something new to the, today. So let's move on. So cut Mulram spline is basically a way how to represent a curve and you can use it in 2D or 3D, which is really, uh, really cool for the project because what we actually wanted to implement and implement it is logic for bridges. Because, uh, well, if you are playing uh, with trains in 2D, it's interesting for sure. But if you can add 3D element with bridges and stuff, it's definitely much more fun. So at the right, uh, right side, you can see an image, which is actually showing how Catmulram spline works in a sense, and I'll try to explain it. So um, let's say you have 100 points, P0 to P100. You are able to calculate uh, Catmulram spline segment only between the four between the two of the four points. So you will, you will pick uh, P0 to P3 and you will get that middle piece exactly. You, you are able then to access every single uh, part of the, of, the, of the curve between P1 and P2. And then if you want to have the next segment, which is between P2 and P3, you will simply slide the window and you will use P1 to P4 and so on and so on. So this way you are basically able to calculate a really smooth movement between the points and it's really advantageous uh, when compared to using some, something like simple Bezier course or something like that because it has some unique properties which are fairly useful for, uh, for the use case, mostly in gaming. And uh, those, uh, those uh, properties are that it goes through all control points, which is really nice because not every curve representation does that. And also it's not generate, generating any creases. Um, like every connection is smooth. It's, it's really something you can, you can take advantage of in calculating some kind of uh, movement and so on. Uh, other, other really nice thing about Catmulram spline is to um, use it for actually 
uh, calculating the vector the object should be facing when moving on the curve. So it faces forward uh, like all the time. So if you want to run some character on some curve in 3D, it will be uh, facing uh, the direction he's running every time. So that's something which is also easily calculatable from a uh, Katmulram spline representation. A uh, reason I actually went, this, went with this approach is to be able to add new track pieces really flexibly. Because if we imagine that uh, I'll construct like 20 new pieces for the game, or I want to add some like crazy loops or something like that, it would be really strange to actually uh, try to calculate each point on, on the uh, on each piece to um, have a smooth path of the movement of the train. But like this, you can only have few key points on each curve segment and you are able to calculate the smooth movement of the train with that using the cut on spline. Uh, I used uh, this, this project or at least part of it uh, because it's handling cut on spline quite nicely. You can also do your own implementation. It shouldn't be anything too hard, but well, why not use libraries, right? So this is what happens if you play with Katmulram splines, but something doesn't really click. Mm, not very cool. It can provide some kind of messy results, I guess. Um, and some weird issues. Uh, when I was getting, for example, the rotation from uh, from the uh, path, it was generating some really weird stuff, as you can could see. So this is this is <laughs> this is the piece of code which is actually trying to fix it somehow. This is something which actually happens quite a lot. Maybe you could use uh, I don't know what I'm doing here dog meme, but well, if you are Android developer and you are dealing with, uh, with uh, such a things, you cannot always win right away. So this is how it actually can look like if it's partially fixed and using the bridges logic, as you can see, the bridges have the issue I already talked about that they scaled down when you when you use the command line tool and also there's also the, there's some glitch at the top something there is handled not quite nicely so it glitches at some point I'm not really sure right now what what's what's the cause but uh, I feel that that's something which should be fixable uh, quite easily. Uh, right now, it should be fairly easy to add new track pieces and to be able to uh, expand the game and make it uh, make it much more rich, uh, at least from point of track pieces. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is like small uh, fun screenshot I took when I was actually debugging some issue with the Katmulram spline. Like the worst part about it is that um, if something is not quite working, uh, the only way how you can actually fully debug the thing is to like do full dump to the logs. And this is something you need to went through and see what's actually happening there. Yeah, so using Catmulron spline has certain advantages, but as you can see also certain disadvantages. So what's actually next up for the project? Uh, as, you, as you can see, the game is not looking really good right now. So we need to add actual textures, which will represent the track pieces. So it looks nicely. 
uh, I need to tweak a building mechanism for, for the game because it's quite complex and it can still have some bugs. Uh, we, of course, need to add some nice UI because um, this is not really something you would you would want to play with for a long time. So uh, we need to add some nice carousels uh, for choosing the track piece. Uh, we need to improve the play mode and so on. And bonus, which is actually quite nice because I can see like multiple kids playing playing with trains on each uh, mobile device of theirs. Uh, we should totally implement cloud anchors because I can see that it wouldn't be that hard for this project and it would bring a lot of um, like interesting functionality to the game. All right, that's end of the presentation. Now it's question time. So moderators, do we have any questions from the audience so far or uh, if there's anyone brave enough and wants to use their mic to actually ask the question, I think you can you can uh, tap some button to raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you to ask the question. Yeah, there are actually two questions already in Q&A. Oh, nice. So uh, have you considered or tried using Google's filament instead of scene form to render the scene since scene form is now deprecated? Um, I thought about using filament, but the project was already started using scene form and filament felt a little bit more complicated than using scene form. It's actually quite nice alternative, I would say. Um, from what I know, it's a little bit more low level. And uh, for example, scene form uh, doesn't allow you to use depth API because uh, you will just get the raw depth info and you need to uh, do the occlusion of the object at yourself. So you need to access um, some kind of render which is not fully accessible in scene form because it's it's hidden from you. So yeah, this could be, for example, one advantage of using filament, but also you would probably work with some, for something a little bit more complex, but maybe, or hopefully a little bit more documented. So yeah, maybe uh, when you are starting new project now, it may be actually uh, nice to look at scene form, look at the demos, look how hard is it actually to navigate it and look at some demo of um, AR, AR core and filament and compare what, what is actually better for you. So I hope this answers the questions. If you have some additional questions, just feel free to share them. Another question is, is it possible to place object in predefined coordinates in the real world in advance that users can view it afterwards on the on that location? If so, how precise is it? Can cloud anchoring be used in this use case? I think that Google introduced something like that. I'm not sure if it's really part of the cloud anchor, like marketing name or something. But when I was doing some research, I saw some photo on the internet. Uh, it was like that you have, for example, your uh, entrance of the, to the restaurant or something. And uh, you can actually like say, okay, this is the place where there will be permanent real world anchor and everyone who will uh, basically come here, they can have uh, some kind of notification or whatever, and they can actually use the place to display some extended menu with images or something like that. So that's definitely something which is in the works or maybe even released. So I can see this like, mm, I can see this as the most useful part of AR actually that you can extend your physical location by AR. That's, that's really cool. Awesome. I also believe that I saw some raised hand. So 
if there is anyone who would like to speak. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So first of all, thank you for, for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to test the game with my son. And uh, I have two questions. First one is, uh, do you plan to publish the game somewhere? And the second question is, why, why you didn't use Bezier curve and what's the main difference between Kapmurom spline and Bezier curve in terms of implementation? So, yeah, the first part is: um, Am I planning to to release release it uh, someday? Yep. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some tweaks which needs to be made to um, to the game to be actually like acceptable to the Play Store. That's something you can also check uh, on the on the website with with uh, guidelines to the AR. So there are certain certain things which needs to be finished, but well, uh, yeah, it, it it's definitely a playable demo to be in a Play Store. And as I explored some apps, uh, even total crap which is crashing is there. So um, Google actually wants to have a lot of AR apps. So bar is pre pretty low now, I would say. And I'm not sure if you are still seeing my screen. Probably yes. Mm -hmm. But the main point against using Bezier curves in this kind of project is uh, the properties of it. Because uh, mm -hmm. let's say that we have this kind of path on the left defined and we want to interpolate points between that. And those points are actually in the center of the track pieces. Then uh, it's not really useful to um, to use the Bezier curves because, well, it's not going through the points and it would be fairly weird to have uh, some path which is not actually adhered by the train. Mm -hmm. So using Katmulram, even though it's maybe probably more difficult and complicated, is really cool because uh, it has those two unique properties, no creases, and it's going through all the points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. What about some other questions? Well, there's one more question in Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's from Stepan. Would you recommend to use Unity or is overkill for simple object placing and animations? Well, I would recommend Unity if you can handle it. That's that's basically the, the answer. The main problem is that um, Unity is uh, yet another and much broader skill to to master to actually do some kind of like AR experience. And well, maybe it's not so hard to handle the basics, but it's up to you to to think about if it's worth. Uh, like learning with Unity to do something simple or if maybe Synform is simpler. I would say that Unity might be a bit more uh, better documented, but it's also super heavyweight for such simple applications. So yeah, I would still probably go with Filament or Synform for something simpler. Okay, what about some more questions? Looks like it so far. All right. Um, in follow-up email, we will probably send some additional info related to this talk. 
will probably include slides and I can also throw in the APK so you can actually try the game yourself. So definitely uh, leave, leave the contact so you can, we can reach you. Is okay. that it? Mm. I think that there are no other questions and I think I have a contact for everyone. So that's good. I think we can also post the link to the YouTube comments or something like that. So even the people who attended through YouTube can actually check it out later. For sure. Uh, I've also checked the uh, YouTube questions and there's none at the moment. So. I think it's all covered. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I think that's it. I would like to thank our speaker. Thank you so much, Andra. Uh, thank to our moderator. Thank you, Vashek. Um, thank you all of you for your participation. Uh, our next STRV event will be uh, from iOS platform, but we can promise you already that we are already preparing some Android talks in the future as well. So if you want to stay updated, just check our websites, the event section, or our Eventbrite platform where you can uh, register for your um, events based on your choose. Uh, okay. That's it. And since we want to be proud of everything we are doing at STRV, uh, we would really appreciate your feedback uh, for this event. As I'm talking right now, I'm sharing the link for the type form right now to the chat section. But you should also be able to get there um, when you will end your uh, attendance here at Zoom. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much again. And I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. See ya. Thank you. Bye.